Today's episode of the Dan Cave is brought to you by Movement Watches. Wanna feel old? Disney's Aladdin turns 25 this week. The 1992 animated classic has been showing us a whole new world for a quarter century now. Oh my God. Now it's on the fast track to becoming a live action movie directed by Guy Ritchie and featuring Will Smith as the genie. And no, that's not a bit, that is real life. But like many of you, I prefer to take a walk down memory lane and relive my childhood. So on today's episode of The Dan Cave, we're gonna run down a whole bunch of things about Aladdin you might not know. Ooh. Aladdin was originally modeled after Michael J. Fox. Oh, this is heavy. That's right, teen wolf, teen heartthrob Michael J. Fox was the original character model inspiration for Aladdin but these early designs proved to be a little too boyish for what Disney wanted to achieve. So to give Aladdin the sex appeal that teens crave, Disney decided to make the would-be prince go shirtless and modeled him after another 80s heartthrob, Tom Cruise. Now, if you're having trouble picturing it, just imagine Aladdin jumping on a couch and freaking out Agrabah's number one talk show host. Can you see it? It's pretty good. <laughs> The role of genie was written specifically for Robin Williams. Okay, you probably knew that much if you've seen Aladdin before, but did you know that in order to get Robin Williams to accept the role, the film's directors, Ron Clements and John Musker, had their animators mock up test animations that were synced with Williams' old stand-up routines. Once again, if there are any little children here tonight, we've used these words in a sentence. <laughs> Now, according to animator Ed Goldberg, what sold Williams was seeing his routine about schizophrenia brought to life in the form of seeing the genie grow a second head to argue with himself. The results, thankfully, spoke for themselves. No second head required. Robin Williams improvised. A lot. Like, a lot. Because the filmmaker specifically wanted his brand of manic energy and natural hilarity in order to bring the genie to life. So they let the actor go kind of hog wild in the studio. As a gifted impressionist, Williams would cycle through certain lines, performing them as Groucho Marx or Peter Lorre or W.C. Fields in rapid succession, allowing the directors to pick and choose their favorite takes. In fact, Williams wound up recording 16 additional hours of improvised material during his recording sessions. The horror. Look at those fangs. I could have been a contender. And as for the urban legend that Williams' epic improv cost Aladdin its chances at being nominated for a Best Adapted Screenplay Oscar. And wrong. Williams put his improv skills to even better use as the peddler. That's right, in addition to the genie, Williams plays the role of the merchant narrator at the beginning of the movie, pushing his wares on an unsuspecting audience. In order to film this scene, Jeffrey Katzenberg had the idea to fill a box with weird stuff, cover it with a cloth, then make Williams take the objects out one at a time and just improvise what he found inside. And that's exactly what wound up on the big screen. <clears throat> ah, still good. One object that didn't make the final cut was when Williams pulled a bra out of the box. He joked that it was a double slingshot, a double yarmulke, and then slyly joked, hmm, I should have called her. Disney, all I'm saying is it's been 25 years, so release the damn tapes and tell us what's in the box. What's in the f***ing box? Disney had a Robin Williams contingency plan. If for some horrible reason Robin Williams had declined the role of the genie, Disney realized they needed a hilarious A-list actor to fill Williams' considerable shoes. To do so, they assembled a B team, including actors like Martin Short, John Goodman, Steve Martin, Eddie Murphy, John Candy, and Albert Brooks. Thankfully, it all worked out because I don't think I could handle hearing Jiminy Glick's horrible voice coming out of the genie's mouth. It just makes me feel slimy all over. Thank you. But maybe they could have cast one of these backup guys because originally there were going to be two genies. That's right, in an early version of Aladdin, there were going to be two genies. A genie of the lamp and a genie of the ring. In this early draft, Aladdin still managed to get his grubby mitts on the lamp and summons the big blue genie we know and love. However, Jafar was going to get his even grubbier mitts on a ring and use it to summon another genie and use it against Aladdin in this genie versus genie showdown. Now, thankfully, that didn't come to pass because honestly, no one movie can sustain that many bits. It'd be like Musk watched the movie. Now, speaking of huge mistakes that thankfully didn't come to pass, Gilbert Gottfried nearly was not the voice of Iago. How in the hell? <clears throat> Everyone's favorite abrasive-voiced Aflac duck is synonymous with Jafar's sassy parrot pal, but he wasn't the studio's first choice for Iago. Before they went on to Gottfried, Disney offered the role to two other famous loud little guys, Joe Pesci and Danny DeVito. Now, I'll be honest, I'm a little sad those versions didn't pan out because I would love to hear Iago's lines replaced with Frank Reynolds quotes from It's Always Sunny. Just picture it. Rum ham! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Where's the rum ham? Disney killed Aladdin's mom. 
Now, dead moms are par for the course in Disney movies. I mean, just look at Bambi, or Beauty and the Beast, or Pinocchio, or Cinderella, or The Little Mermaid, or look, you get it, you get it, they kill moms. But in Aladdin's case, she was killed by the production process. In early drafts of the movie, Aladdin sings his mom a sweet song entitled Proud of Your Boy. And unfortunately, it's hard to be proud when you've been written out of existence. But thankfully, the song made its way into the Broadway version of Aladdin, because honestly, an Alan Menken song is a horrible thing to waste. As for Jafar, Jonathan Freeman did a fantastic job bringing this sinister sorcerer to life with a voice that's equal parts Boris Karloff and Vincent Price, but he also wasn't the studio's first pick, no. I must advise against this. The House of Mouse had their sights set on another iconic set of vocal cords, Sir Patrick Stewart's. Everyone's favorite Starfleet captain turned down loads of Disney roles over the years, like King Triton in Little Mermaid, Cogsworth in Beauty and the Beast, Zazu in The Lion King, Zeus in Hercules, and Governor Ratcliffe in Pocahontas. But the one that he legitimately regrets turning down? Not being in Aladdin. He was so close, yet so Jafar. <laughs> and those are some facts you might not know about Disney's Aladdin. But tell me, what's your favorite memory of Aladdin? What would you add to this list? Let us know in the comments below. Give me a whole new thumbs up while you're there. Now be sure to like and subscribe or else you might miss next week's show about the story of a young woman who disguises herself as a male soldier and winds up trying to find a mythical promised land with a bunch of dinosaurs in Mulan before time. Until next time, keep on digging. Thanks again to Movement Watches for sponsoring today's episode. Now, I would rather shoot myself out of a cannon into the sun than go holiday shopping, because being around those huddled masses yearning for deals fills me with dread and anxiety, but thankfully, there's a better way, thanks to Movement Watches. Movement Watches was started by two broke college kids who wanted to wear stylish watches. Movement makes the perfect gift because they start at just $95, which is way cheaper than the $400 to $500 you'd pay at a department store. Movement figured out that by selling online, they're able to cut out the middleman and retail markup, providing the best possible price, along with classic design, quality construction, and styled minimalism. It must be working considering they've sold over 1 million watches in 160 countries. Now is the time to step up your watch game and head over to movement.com slash cave to get 15% off with free shipping and free returns. So get a watch that features clean design and makes a great fashion statement. Join the movement. Let's open up the old mailbag, shall we? At Super Gerbil asks, what's your favorite spooky moment that happened in a non-spooky TV show or movie? Well, that's a great question, Super Gerbs. I'd have to go back to that moment that scared me the most as a kid, and that is when Judge Doom is melting at the end of Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and he's screaming this horrible high-pitched scream, and then his freaking eyeballs pop out of his skull. It scarred me for life, I tell you what. But you tell me, what's your favorite unexpectedly spooky moment in a supposedly non-spooky film or TV show? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you guys next time.